Happy Friday, everybody. What's going on? Fantasy football today. Now, we are recording on Thursday, which means for us, one week until baseball's back. Who is genuinely excited for the start of baseball season? Will Brinson. <laughs> I doubt that. I'm definitely a little excited. Yeah. I mean, I did not realize it was one week away. I'll say that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, two games on th- on next Thursday and the rest on Friday. And then, yeah, baseball starts and sports. I guess, you know, sports is technically back, but since I don't watch any of the sports that are back right now, it doesn't really feel that way for me. So I'm looking for I can't the wait. The major sports are back. I did a, uh, a Twitter poll about the start of NFL training camp. And I want to get your, your vote. What date will all teams be in training camp completely? Were there not, options? Not rookies, not rookies, but full training camp, all NFL teams. See results. What, see results was not an option because it's, this is a guessing one, so it's okay to just everybody guess. Okay. What? I don't know. Are you going to give the options, or we just want to? July 28th, well, is it, scheduled Is it a poll all guessing anyway? <laughs> July 20th? No, no, no. Generally, you have a strong opinion. Who do you want? And you know who you want. You might be wrong, but it's still who you want. Okay. Uh, anyway, July 28th, August 4th. August 11th, after August 11th. C. August 4th. I say the 11th. Yeah, somewhere in there. 11th was my guess as well. Yeah, uh, August 11th, one or zero preseason games, and hope, hopefully an on-time start to the season. There yep. will not be preseason games. Yep. That's my expectation as well. August 11th, no preseason games, on-time start to the season. Watch it be July twenty eighth. We have we're, we're not experts, but well, Chiefs so. well, rookies. The, that, all teams will is I don't think all teams are going to report on twenty eighth, right? I don't. Well, I, yeah, Chiefs rookies are supposed to report on Saturday. Chiefs and Texans rookies on Saturday, but that's pro, that's not going to happen because they, none of them have been tested yet, and you have to be tested forty eight hours before you show up. Yeah, we do have some uh, testing news coming in. We'll get to news and notes. We have news about Mark Andrews. He's going to play. He does have type 1 diabetes, but he says he's going to play. Um, so, yeah, we'll get into that. The Derrick Henry contract and what it means. Uh, we got a fun show today. We got Fantasy Jeopardy coming up. Don't really think Heat's going to win based on history. I mean, he might, uh, might have the most points, but it doesn't mean I'm going to call him the winner. We got your emails at fantasyfootball at cbsi.com. We got your Apple podcast questions. And um, I said on Twitter, I said, hey, help me out. Do my job for me. Give me something spicy to start the show. And I picked my two favorites, and here they are. S- something spicy to start the show, number one, from Fantasy Chatter. Le'Veon Bell, RB1 overall this year. And the Jets' uh- offense takes flight with Sam Darnold healthy. Le'Veon eats on the ground and in the passing game. Book it. Ooh, that is I spicy. Did. I did some Azer math (laughs) to try to check out how realistic this might possibly be. And so if you take Le'Veon Bell's 16-game pace for touches from last year and then give him his career efficiency, just assuming last year was a down year, um, that would put him at 279 PPR points, which would have made him number six or seven last year. I feel like I already did that math somewhere in my notes, but... (laughs) Okay, number six or seven. That's that's not bad. That's not bad. What about the, just the concept of the Jets' offense taking flight? There was a three-game stretch where they scored, I, I think they scored 34 points each week, and Sam Darnold was really good. And, of course, it was against three pretty bad defenses, or at least two very bad defenses. I think it was the Giants, Redskins, and Raiders. Um, and that was more or less it for Darnold. So, But I think a lot of people really kind of think he's very talented and has a lot of potential. So what do you, what are the chances of the Jets offense um, surprising us and being really good this year? Ben. Uh, I mean, the, the, there's a possibility because they have a young quarterback who is talented, but I will say, you know, PFF just released their offensive line rankings going into the season, like last week. Uh, and, you know, the Jets have made a lot of moves along the offensive line this year, this off season, they still rank 27th there and they were very low last year. Um, so they're at least trying to address that, but the, it, kind of the consensus there was they didn't exactly add some, some great offensive line pieces. So I, I do think the line is an underrated part of this. And then we know that they lost Robbie Anderson, who was a key part of their, their passing game and at least being able to stretch defenses. They added Brashad Perriman, but, I think Anderson has the better track record there as a deep threat. 
I don't know that they really have the skill possession talent either. And if you don't have a great line, you're not a great. I mean, you could be happy about Darnold. You also don't have a, a coach with a great track record. I mean, sure, there's potential for it, but I'm I'm pretty much uh, going to just lean towards the consensus on this one, which I don't always do, but I will definitely hear and think that the Jets are just – they're not going to be good. I think that's the, the smart approach is that the Jets won't be good, but um, – there is so much unknown with them because uh, I, I know, you know, PFF is going on what they think is going to happen with the line, but it could be a decent line, which, you know, that's, you know, from Le'Veon's perspective, that's certainly something that he can benefit from. And then the skill positions. Yes. While they lose Robbie Anderson, they get three additions to replace him. They get Chris Herndon, who they didn't have last year, who I think still has some talent and can be very successful. They get not only Brashad Perryman, but also Denzel Mims. And we like Mims coming into the draft process. I know Heath did. I, I did as well. I don't know about you, Ben. But, um, you know, he, he's certainly an added piece to this offense. So, you know, with Jamison Crowder, they do have now three receivers that can help Sam Darnold. And then again, you know, Darnold taking that next step. So um, Le'Veon needs all of those things working well for him, I think, to have the chance to be top six. Uh, I think top, uh, the top running back would be a significant, significant stretch. Um, based on what we saw from him last year. The, the thing for me with, with Bell is I just think Gase is going to ruin him because of uh, Frank Gore. You know, he's, he's just going to throw Gore in there in these situations that are going to make it frustrating. And so that's the thing that scares me about Bell is the, 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 the positive things not happening to the level that I think they need to. And then Gase just, you know, doing what Gase does, which is, you know, trying to rely on pieces that probably don't fit. All right, let's go to our second spicy Something spicy to start the show from Robert Canfield. DeAndre Swift finishes with a thousand plus rushing yards and 65 or more catches, earning top 10 RB status. DeAndre Swift, a thousand yards on the ground. He'd be the first since 2013 for the Lions and 65 plus catches, which he would be the first since Theo Riddick probably a couple years ago. I mean, before last year, Lions running backs got a lot of catches, uh, but last year was, a, was an exception. Um, but okay, that's the spicy take. DeAndre Swift, a thousand plus rushing yards, sixty-five plus catches, top ten running back. Heath, I liked the Le'Veon Bell one better, and I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think that was particularly realistic. Really? Um, yeah, like I have a hard time seeing DeAndre Swift. Like we're saying, he's going to average four and a half yards per carry and earn two hundred and twenty carries and catch sixty-five passes and be above average in terms of efficiency on a bad lion. Like, I don't, I just don't see it at all. Okay. By the way, he was third on Georgia in catches in his sophomore season, fourth on the team in receptions in his junior season. He did not catch as many passes as Clyde Edwards Elair, but he caught somewhere around 55 passes in his last two seasons at Georgia. Very good for running back. Um, so, all right, Ben, uh, why don't you give your take here? DeAndre Swift, 1,000-plus rushing guards, 65-plus catches. Is that less realistic than uh, Le'Veon Bell just having a huge year on a surging Jets offense? I'll take this one more. I mean, part of it's because we're talking about 1,000 yards compared to being the overall RB1. And the Le'Veon Bell thing, like, to me, it's just you're saying RB1 because he's been it before, but you got to recognize how much the offense plays into that. The Steelers' offense and situation is so much different than the Jets'. It would be so hard for him to do that in the Jets offense, even if they were better. Swift, for me, I, I can kind of see it. I'm not thrilled about it. Adam, you and I have gone back and forth, just talked a little bit about the their offensive line. So just to reference these rankings as well, it's funny. I said they had a good line, and you noted that they had lost some pieces that I had forgotten about and said they might have a bad line. They ranked 16th. So they're, they're <laughs> dead middle of the pack on this. So okay. we'll have to split the difference a little bit here. Um, well, I can I take that. It, I mean, I, if you want to believe in a running game, then I, 16th is perfectly fine. Right. Yeah. It's not, it's not bad. Right. And I think, um, you know, they, they took Swift high enough and they, they could, especially if carry got hurt or something, which he has had a lot of injury troubles, they could t turn over enough work to him that he could do this. But um, I think it would require, it would certainly require their line to play well and it would require um, Stafford to stay healthy as well and be as good as he was last year, I think in the passing game, which would take a lot of the pressure off of Swift. And, and this offense could suddenly be, you know, somewhat decent and, uh, we did see some of that last year. Stafford played well. So, there, I mean, I, I, I could see more upside in the Lions offense than I can see in the Jets offense for sure. I would also take this over Le'Veon Bell, but the only way this one happens is if on gets hurt week one or, you know, first three weeks of the season and, 
and then Swift is just amazing. So, you know, we, we've said this a lot, you know, I, I think Dave is counting on DeAndre Swift just completely kicking carry on to the side, but I think it's going to take carry on getting hurt for DeAndre Swift to be as good as, you know, if you're drafting him in, in the first four rounds, that that's, I think, you know, where you're going to have to really benefit the value for, for DeAndre Swift as a carry on injury. And for these numbers to happen, that's going to have to happen early in the year. All right. So in the last eight seasons, a Lions running back has had 50 or more catches seven times. And then two other occasions, Reggie Bush in 2014, carry on Johnson in 2018. They were on pace for 50 or more catches, but they had shortened seasons. So it's been a big part of Matthew Stafford's game, but it wasn't last year, even when he was healthy. Um, Maybe looks like another person 72 combined catches for all of their running 73. I think for all of their running backs last year, Garbro had like 60 though. Right? Is, is that, um, <laughs> is that just weird? Is that just fluky? Is that because they don't have Theo Riddick or Reggie Bush anymore? No, I think Ben's talked about this. I think Daryl Bevel is generally like, he likes to run the ball, but when they throw it, I think he's generally more of a downfield attack type uh, passing game. Okay. All right. Uh, we would need your help. Go to podcastawards.com slash app slash sign up and then toggle down to the sports category. There's also a link straight to that uh, in our episode description, but please help us out and nominate Fantasy Football Today on Podcast Awards. We want to win it this year. Podcastawards.com slash app slash sign up. And also sign up for our newsletter, cbssports.com slash newsletter. Stay up to date with fantasy football content as draft season is almost upon us. The news you need to know, podcast alerts, stuff like that in your inbox every day. All right, so let's go through the news and notes, guys. And then we got some emails to read, some Jeopardy, and some Apple Podcast reviews. Thank you, by the way, for the Apple Podcast reviews. Getting a lot of them this week. And um, very helpful stuff. Good questions. Really good questions. We're going to read them today. So Mark Andrews will play this season despite having type 1 diabetes. But obviously, it's, it's, a, risk, it's, a, you know, it's a risky condition to have with this with this disease out there. So does, is this going to factor into your, your Mark Andrews rankings? Is the possibility that he might say, Hey, I don't know. I can't do it anymore. You know, does that enter into your thoughts at all? Not now. Uh, yeah. If you got to feel better about it now that he's addressed it. Okay. Fair enough. As of July 10th, 72 players had tested positive for the coronavirus. We don't know how many were, were tested, but it seems like their initial uh, tests are the positives are going to be higher percentage wise than baseball's uh, baseball's testing rate was, but uh, we'll see. Um, we'll have more information soon, I hope. Would well, you see the Pro Football Talk report about how much time people will miss? Three weeks, huh? They'll be three on the, the COVID nineteen list for three weeks. Any player testing positive. So, what do you make of that? You're gonna see a lot of waiver wire moves this year. <laughs> Yeah, that's a tough one for fantasy football, period. There, there's a couple of things, and I, I mentioned one of these to Ben. I wonder if I should be a little bit more open to handcuffing this year with this going on. And then the other thing is that I, other thing that I kind of wonder a little bit, maybe it just shouldn't matter. It doesn't matter in best ball, I don't think, or any type of high stakes contest, but just your regular 12 team league where half the t- league's making the playoffs. I wonder if you need just a little bit more security in the later rounds, knowing that you're more likely to have to use those bench guys. And I, one thing I thought was interesting because yeah, Heath and I did talk about this. Um, There's in in this note, there was some, some discussion that anyone who was exposed would also be quarantined. Right. And so if I think that's an interesting thing too, like I, I, I agree with Heath that probably being more open to handcuffing makes sense, but it also wouldn't shock me if we see situations where the starting running back tests positive and his backup gets quarantined because he's been practicing in position drills with him and in meetings with him all week. You know, I mean, that's. It could be the whole room. Yeah. But then who plays running back? It's like I said to Heath, like someone's got to well, play running back for him. Yeah. Running back that we could probably figure that out. Quarterback. You might just have to have uh, different rooms for your quarterbacks because you can't have all your quarterbacks. Honestly, it, it's really amazing. Like, you know, Cam was sitting out there. We don't know how the contract discussions were. If, if you were a playoff, like I, I would have made him an offer more than what the Patriots played him just to have him on your roster, just in case your quarterback goes down. Like it's, it's just crazy to me that these teams didn't put a little bit more stock into, you know, when Jameis was out there with, with cam out there and, and, you know, some of the contracts that they may have been able to give those guys if it worked out for their, their team. But 
man, there's going to be some scenarios where imagine the Chiefs don't have Mahomes for three weeks or the Ravens don't have Lamar Jackson for three weeks. And forget about fantasy, just, you know, the implications that that could have on on those NFL rosters, if that's the case. You know, it's, it's probably why the Chiefs are bringing back Matt Moore. Well, Bruce Arians talked about, I'm not sure if he was kidding or not. I don't think he was, but he mentioned keeping a third quarterback just away from the team, basically, or away yep. from the meeting rooms, uh, just to have that safety net. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a there's a quarterback sort of on call that just does not really is not really around the team all that much. It's gonna be an interesting it's be a season. Wacky year. It's be a it is, wacky and you know what? Like baseball is gonna show us, I guess, in a sense, if it can be done. You know, um, yeah, I I don't think baseball will be as crazy though, just because like you don't have twelve guys starting right up against each other every play. Basketball is probably uh, yeah, a better indication. Okay, yeah. fine, both sports. They're, they're, they'll be back soon. We'll see how they do. But soccer's I, been playing in there. You know, they have contact to an extent. Yeah, they did base. They pulled baseball off in Korea. Uh, it's just really these players are going to have to be uh, extra cautious, I guess. And the baseball players have been talking about it. They, they will be extra cautious. You know, they, they have a responsibility to each other. It's fingers crossed. <laughs> Make it happen, guys. It's a tough, it's a tough uh, ask to, for these if athletes. If the Yankees win the World Series, does it come with an asterisk for you this No. Time? The Only are, if the Yankees win the World Series. Anybody so, else wins it, it's, it's legit. Like the Yankees are so good, it's insane. They're like 100% going to win the World Series. That's I'm almost not excited for baseball because it's just inevitable that they're going to win the World Series. It's like It's a joke. Are they healthy now? They are, except for Chapman and LeMahieu, who both have COVID. The judge? Judge homered yesterday or Wednesday. Okay. Um, Derek Henry, four-year, $50 million deal, $25.5 million guaranteed. Heath, what does this mean for Derek Henry's dynasty value? Um, I went in and changed his risk factor just a little bit. Um, I feel more confident in where he's going to be for the next three years. So it didn't really, it didn't change his place in the rankings enough, but uh, he's still a low-end number one, high-end number two running back for me in dynasty. You think he's there in three years? I think three is the number from what I understand about, but maybe it's only two. I would I say two. Does anybody, well, does anybody this think- an extension and, and they're, t- it's new money in 2021 and 2022. Right. I don't know. Cause what are they doing about this year? He, he was set to play on the franchise tag. He didn't have any years left. Right. So the extension lowered the, the cap hit for this year. And I believe for next year, and then the cap hit is pretty extensive in 2022. And then I think there's an out after that. Okay. Uh, does this change his value this year in any way? I actually have that wrong. 2021, the cap number is a lot is a lot higher. It's just this year that it lowered the cap number. Interesting. Uh, does it change his value? No. I think if you're going to you know, go get Derrick Henry, you're going to take him you know, probably middle of the first round in non-PPR, back into the first round in PPR, and that's you know, where he should go if you want to draft him. He's not making it past the first 15 overall picks, mostly. It's a fly on my face. Jamie's going to accuse me of picking my nose, but I, if I if you see that, I'm just swatting away a little stupid fruit fly. So pardon me for that. All right, we got a few emails here. And Jeopardy, really looking forward to it. Uh, Fantasy football at CBSI.com. Hey, foot, base, basket, and bowling. Balls. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Mike from Salem, Massachusetts, for getting Heath to say that. I am the commissioner of a 12-team PPR league that is highly competitive. Sometimes you have to think outside the box to get ahead with these maniacs, and I have an idea. Hear me out. I had Lamar last year, and I finished second. I've been in love ever since. I'm going to have the sixth pick this year, and here's what I'm thinking. If I take Lamar sixth overall and then take the best available wide (laughs) receiver— What? No? (laughs) Sorry, go ahead. Uh, if I take Lamar at six overall and then take the best available wide receiver in round two, Evans, Godwin, Godwin Tyreek Hill, it will not be Tyreek Hill. Um, aren't I getting three players in one? I'm getting a top 10 to 15 running back and a top five fantasy quarterback in one player. That's Lamar, obviously. With him, then I get a top tier wide receiver. And then I work my way to the end, knowing there's a lot of value down the road. Am I totally insane or am I an evil genius? Super insane. In super insane. So first of all, I, this happened a lot last year. People showed Lamar's rushing and they said, here's how it would rank among the fantasy running backs, but they never included the running backs receiving. They would always say his rushing value is this good. You're getting a, a top 10 running back. 
but you weren't actually getting a top 10 running back with just Lamar's uh, rushing because he didn't catch a single pass, right? So all these running backs that we were just ignoring their, their receiving work to say that Lamar was giving you that. And then secondly, you're not getting that plus a top five four fantasy quarterback because if you take out Lamar's rushing, you then don't have a top five fantasy quarterback with just his passing. You have Kyler Murray, basically, which was uh, last year, who was like QB 10. In if, passing, if, he had, if he had no rushing stats. Right. But, and no that was with him stats. throwing 36 touchdowns but last year. But if Kyler Murray had no rushing stats, like he would have been QB 20-something. No, what I'm right. saying is if you – yeah, yeah. But if you take Lamar Jackson's fantasy points, subtract all of his ru- – I just did this right now. Subtract all of his rushing totals, seven touchdowns and 1,200 yards, he would have scored about the same amount of points as Kyler Murray, who was so in six-point per passing touchdown leagues. And that was somewhere around QB 10. So, I mean, he still was very good, right? Back end of the top 10 quarterback. I'm just saying you're not getting a top 10 to 15 fantasy running back with just his rushing, and you're not getting a top five fantasy quarterback with just his passing. And that's, I think, where his thinking is going wrong because he thinks he's getting three players in one. Well, he also has to do that exact same thing again, which is, yeah. you know, historical. <laughs> I mean, like, that's the stupid part of it. It's like, uh, you know, he, he's, he's going to be good if he's healthy. He's not going to be that good, though. That's, that's very difficult to do. Man, it's weird. So his rushing totals were like equal to Tariq Cohen in PPR. In terms of his fantasy points without the catches, as Ben said, you just take the 1,200 yards and seven touchdowns and no catches at all. Tariq Cohen scored so, as many points. So you're getting a QB streamer and a flex. <laughs> yeah. Now, right. if you're in a non PPR league, it might be different. I, you know what? I'm kind now, of. If you curious. want to take Lamar at six, go ahead. Well, just, take him in the second take, round. Like. But, if, you, but, if you're dying to well, have I mean, him. we don't know how quarterbacks go in, in Mike's league, but just take him and enjoy him and then you know, get another running back along with it. You know, don't, don't stress yourself out. Okay, let's see in non PPR. Philip Lindsay. Uh, That's better. Yeah, Kenyon Drake. Kenyon Drake, Philip Lindsay. Alvin Kamara scored like 166 fantasy points in non PPR, and Lamar Jackson scored like 162 rushing. Okay, uh, next question here from Taylor in Oregon. I'm going to combine it with an Apple podcast review from Bayou Bengal Elite. Uh, Taylor says, Dear Rory, John, Justin, Dustin, and Webb, I think those are golfers. What do you think of the draft strategy of targeting a promising, rook- promising rookie running back while also drafting the veteran probable week one starter, like drafting both Chiefs guys, both Lions guys, both Ravens guys. No, not Lions. He didn't put them in. Both Colts guys and both Ravens guys. And then Bayou Bengal Elite on Apple Podcasts said, could uh, Damian Williams be a sleeper? His ADP is so late with everyone being so high on Clyde Edwards Elair. Uh, with everything go- going on, it's hard for me to take Edwards Elair where he keeps going. So I don't know. It's a question about the veteran uh, running backs, I guess, in these backfields. But what do you think about uh, getting both guys in a backfield? I think it's great. We talked about this a few weeks ago. You know, I, I said I would take both Edward Tillaire and Damien Williams. So we just finished talking about, you know, is it smart to handcuff some of these uh, running back situations? And these are very feasible to do. So, you know, you're looking at the way Baltimore ran the ball last year. Dobbins could be an absolute stud. If Ingram goes down, he's probably going to step into the 130 or so carries, potentially at least that Gus Edwards is, you know, uh, could vacate um, Williams and, and Keith has alluded to this before, you know, Williams and, and Edwards Hilaire can just split up 26 carries that the chiefs had last year, you know, so you're doing 13 each with what they'll do in the passing game. That'll be great. Uh, Mac may get off to a good start early in the season before Taylor, you know, shoves him off the field if that's what happens as Ben has alluded to many times. So, you know, the, one could get you off to a good start and then one could finish the season or if there's a guy that misses time because of whatever case, then you're going to be in good shape either way. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a smart strategy, but don't force it. If you don't have to, you know, don't reach for, you know, Williams is going to be the first one that goes be my guess, maybe him or Dobbins, but um, you know, if you can get Edward Solaire probably early around three, I think is where he'll end up settling or maybe middle around three. And then Williams in that round six, round seven range, I think that's fine. And then the other guys are easy to do. Ben and, and these three examples are all really good offenses. If you were going right? to, if, well, let me ask you this, Ben, if you were going to pick one backfield based on ADP, uh, to get both guys, which one would you choose? Uh, probably the Chiefs. Okay. I'm comfortable with that. Heath, how about you? Definitely the Ravens because 
Um, Ingram's down in round five, six. Dobbins can be had in round seven, eight. Um, so that'd be my favorite for sure. One more question for now. Nick in San Francisco. Hey, Melvin, Monte, James, and Jonathan. Badgers runners. Badgers, that's right. Um, okay, he's got a lengthy email about Jonathan Taylor. I'll sum it up. He's watched uh, some Jonathan Taylor tape, doesn't think he's as great as, doesn't think he was worthy of the hype, and he thinks that that soft schedule for the Colts will actually benefit Marlon Mack. So, Ben, since you uh, always draft Jonathan Taylor, what would you like to say to Nick in San Francisco? Well, yeah, I saw this email and I pointed it out to you because he he also commented that um, Taylor does not seem comparable to Zeke, and I've made that comparison before. And he said that that Taylor's been held uh, by some good defenses like Ohio State, and that's just I, I don't think really holds water if you dig into it. Taylor did have a couple poor games against Ohio State, but he did have a 150-yard game against Ohio State in the third time that he faced him, and there's pretty much no other team that stopped him. He had 100 yards every all three times he played Michigan. He had over 100 total yards and two scores when he played Michigan State. He had over 100 yards every time he played Iowa. Uh, he was better against some bad teams for sure. And if you look at Zeke's profile when he was in college, he was dominant in their title run when, when Zeke was a sophomore and crushed Alabama, crushed Oregon in the title game. So there's definitely a note in Zeke's favor that he was really good against good competition. But I don't think it holds water that Taylor was bad against good, good competition. He was, he was worse than he was against – bad schools but you'd expect a really good player to be good against bad schools and and you expect their team to lead more and he would run more uh but what one thing i thought was really interesting i started digging into this is like they're actually super super comparable like i just want to re-emphasize how good of a prospect taylor is uh his final season he caught 26 passes for 252 yards zeke really only played in two of his three years he got 27 and 28 passes for 206 and 220 yards so he, he was used as a, a receiver in two seasons where taylor kind of only was in one season but their receiving lines per those seasons were very similar. And I think that's an area where people think Taylor can't really play. Um, and then if you look at their rushing, I mean, Taylor's rushing was better, just kind of generally over all three seasons than Zeke's best season. Uh, but, but still comparable. I think Zeke was very efficient. Taylor was very efficient. Taylor was more efficient in the passing game. He almost had as many receiving yards over their careers as Zeke did. And then you look at them as prospects. Taylor ran a four, three, nine, Zeke ran a 447. So Taylor was about eight hundredths of a second faster, almost a tenth of a second faster. He was one pound heavier and he was two inches shorter. So he's actually thicker than Zeke. His BMI is a lot higher. Um, he tested better in the jumps. He was a lot more explosive. Zeke didn't run the agility drills, but Taylor was above average in the agility drills. So from a physical standpoint, it's every tested bit of evidence we have shows that Taylor is also the superior athlete frankly, they're about the same size and he tested better. Uh, obviously now Taylor didn't go in the top 10. He doesn't step right into a situation like Zeke did where he's the clear lead back and a huge one. Zeke was well known for his pass blocking. Uh, Taylor has a little bit more questions, some, some more questions there. Taylor has some fumble issues. There, there are some differences, but I actually think like as far as what kind of prospect they are, you look at their production and even look at the fact, you know, the receiving, like I said, um, and you look at their, their testing like, they are very, very similar. Taylor is a very, very good prospect. All right, Heath, what's so funny? Can I ask so you a question, Ben? Because I'm curious. Uh, obviously, you love Taylor for redraft, and this would stink. But in Dynasty, if Jonathan Taylor was Melvin Gordon, would you be happy or disappointed? I'd be, I'd be happy. I'd be thrilled. I mean, he's been a star. I mean, Gordon's another guy who didn't catch a lot of passes at Wisconsin, which is something we see with some college offenses. Um and one other thing I noticed with Taylor, I mean, just to throw this out there, he caught multiple passes 12 times, only 11 times in his career out of 41 games. Did he have a sub five yards per carry in a game? So about a quarter of his games, seven of those uh, 11 games were his multi were multi-catch games. And then he only had multi-catch games in five of the other 30 games, which is to say that when, when he wasn't efficient running the ball, that's when they actually did try to use him in the passing game. And he had some explosive plays in the passing game. I do think the fact that he didn't catch a ton of balls is mainly because of what their offense was. It's how it was with Melvin and then Melvin went to the pros and he caught way more passes. Uh, it would not surprise me if something similar happened with, with Taylor. And if, if he has a career similar to, to, to Gordon's in that regard, where he can catch some passes and score some touchdowns. Um, but yeah, I would be thrilled with that. I think he, that's a good career. Yeah. I mean, the only reason I bring it up you is because obviously Melvin it. Gordon was terrible as a rookie, but he was great since then, aside from yeah. the holdout, you know, so if you're getting that in Dynasty, you'd be happy with that. But in redraft, you'd be miserable if you're getting sure, that in 2020. Sure. 
All right, Heath, I'm sorry. It's, I, you're cracking me up. Why am I cracking you up? I, you was had, just, it was, I was watching the tracker, and Jonathan Taylor, during the first answer, passed DJ Moore for our most talked about player this year. <laughs> and then during the second answer, he passed AJ Brown. He's now our number one most talked about player this year. All right. Hey, congratulations. We need some balloons for, uh, for Jonathan Taylor. I, no, I think that stuff's really interesting. And Yeah, look, it could, it could favor Marlon Mack, though, out of the gate. It's a good point by Nick. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, this isn't a knock on the Mac point at all. Cause like the, the stuff about the O-line, they graded number one overall in this PFF thing. And their schedule is the number one softest schedule. If you look at Vegas win losses mm-hmm. by a lot, by a lot over the next best, uh, next softest schedule, those things are very favorable to running. And so, yeah, that those things could definitely end up pointing towards Mac. Sure. I thought you were going to ask us for a, a spicy, um, something spicy. So I had, uh, five running backs you could draft after round six that you could win your league with if you start with three wide receivers and a tight end and Mac was one of the five. So, okay. I mean, it's just, it, these guys are going to be great value picks they're, they're, and, and if he holds on to the job and still gets however much percent of the touches until maybe Taylor takes over, you're going to be okay. All right. Well, that was some good stuff guys, but let's see how you do with jeopardy. Let's see, how, let's see how you do when you have to answer in the form of a question, which is always a struggle with this group. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, let the games begin on Fantasy Football Today. All right, here we go. Everybody's favorite fantasy game show. It's time for Fantasy Jeopardy. I've got three categories and uh, three answers within each category. They are for $200, $400, and $600. And the three categories are team stats, player stats, and Azer stats. Oh God! <laughs> Heath, Team stats player. Okay, <laughs> Heath, uh, the board is yours. We're gonna let you go first. And if you want to buzz in, please just say your name, and I will call on you. Go ahead, Heath. Um, Azer stats for six hundred. Azer stats for six hundred. Okay, this early round running back averaged three point seven yards per carry or less in each of his last eight games, including the postseason. 3.7 yards per carry or less in each what of was, his... was Did he finish top 10 or did... He's an early the... round drafted oh, running ADP. back. I'll tell you, first two rounds. Last eight games, including the playoffs. He went to the playoffs. He averaged 3.7 yards per carry or, or worse or less in every game. Three, two... By the way, you don't lose points for guessing, so... Heath. All right, Heath, Heath, what do you got? Uh, Ezekiel Elliott. Like you mean who is Ezekiel Elliott? Who is and Ezekiel Elliott? Who is Ben? Oh, okay, Ben. Uh, <laughs> oh, Austin Eckler. I have no idea. They were not in the playoffs. Oh yeah, they were in the playoffs. <laughs> Jamie, you got a <laughs> guess? No, you know what? I'm not gonna allow it. I'm not gonna allow it. Who is Dalvin Cook? Oh, interesting. Really limped to the finish line there, Dalvin Cook. Uh, all right, uh, Heath, the board is still yours. Azer stats for 400, please. Okay, this quarterback. Averaged 34 fantasy points per game against two of his division po- opponents and 20.5 against everyone else. <laughs> it's a great Azer stat. <laughs> <laughs> this quarterback averaged 34 points against two of his division opponents and 20 and a half points per game against everyone else. JV's like, I feel like you want to jump Heath. In Heath. Who is Russell Wilson? Um, Jamie. Jamie. Who is Josh Allen? <laughs> ben. Uh, ben. Matthew Stafford. Yeah, I didn't even have to try. It was who is Dak Prescott? Oh. Giants and Redskins. He torched them. He torched them. I thought maybe that was uh, Allen against the Dolphins or the. No, he, yeah, that he only had one game, I think, with more than 25 points, Josh Allen, and that was against the Dolphins, but no. Such that, an Azer stat. Yeah, oh, yeah sure is. <laughs> All right, Heath, the board is yours. Azer stats for 200, please. In his last eight games, he was on pace for 119 catches, 1,515 yards, and five touchdowns on 181 targets. Heath. Heath. Who is Devontae Adams? <laughs> you guys suck. 
His last five games? <laughs> his last eight games. 119 eight games. catches, 1,500 yards, five touchdowns. You can't on even pace for five touchdowns in eight games. It has to be a brown uh, Yeah, well, well okay, number. I round it up. 4.6, whatever, who knows? What, did he have 2.3 touchdowns? No, come on, we've done enough clues. The time's up. <laughs> you're right about that. I don't know how it could have been. Probably, it was probably... Uh, it's mathematically impossible. Yeah, you're probably right come about on. that. Don't... Steven Time's Sims. <laughs> I got to figure this out here. Uh, Robert Woods. What did you say? Who is Robert Woods? Robert Woods. Is that right? No, it's Robert Woods. That was my first thought, but I was like, he only scored two touchdowns. You can't pace for five. Oh, I should have said four then, huh? I remember the 118 catches. Yeah, you still should have. You still should have gotten it. Um, I should have said the, four to four touchdowns. Like it was incorrect. You yeah. gave us bad information. That's my bad. Yeah. That's my bad. It was a, it was a oh, wait. I know what it I was did. the Azer of all Azer stats no. because it wasn't uh, even right. It was his last <laughs> seven games, not his last eight games. Okay. okay. That's, that's, why that's why it was not five no five points touchdowns. transferred hands on that one. Damn it. No, Jamie got <laughs> well, it. I don't get points for that. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm giving it to Jamie. Oh, that was such an Azer stat. Damn. I Azered the hell out of that. <laughs> All right, you Jamie, your own stats. the board is yours. $200 in your bank account. What are the categories again? Team stats and fan and player stats. Let's do player stats for 200 These are the only two players with 97 or more catches in each of the last three seasons. These? Two players oh. with 97 or more catches in each ben. of the last three seasons. Ben. Uh, Michael Thomas and Christian McCaffrey? <laughs> Oh crap! I didn't look at McCaffrey. I only did. McCaffrey wide has the hundred catches the last two years. No, but no, he didn't have seasons. it the first. He didn't have it. It three is years three. Ago. I don't know if he did it in his rookie year. I don't think that's he why did. I said that as a question. <laughs> he didn't do it. I don't think year. he did. Yeah. Okay. Who? Uh, Ninety-seven or more each the last three years. Uh-huh. Heath. Heath. Michael Thomas and DeAndre Hopkins. Each of the last three years, or each of his <laughs> last three years. The last three years. The last three years. Um, These are hard today. Michael Thomas and Julio Jones. Michael Thomas. Who are Michael Thomas and Keenan Allen? Oh. Jamie, the board is yours. Player stats and uh, team player stats. Player stats for 400. Okay. Got to kind of listen to this one. Pay attention. Okay. Oh, this is kind it. of an Azer stats. More Azer stats. <laughs> among, Azer quarter, stats two. among quarterbacks currently in the top 24 in ADP, who threw 200 or more passes last season. Okay. So, like. It's really not that complicated, but not Joe Burrow, not Ben Roethlisberger, not Drew Locke. This quarterback had the lowest touchdown rate in 2019. Ben. Go ahead. Jared Goff. Nice, Ben. 400 for Ben. And you know what? If he had had a 5.7% touchdown rate like he did in uh, 2018, Goff would have thrown, I think, 36 touchdowns. Would have had a much different season. Uh, ben, the board is yours. Uh, I don't know what's available, so just pick something. All right, we have team stats, all of the categories, and we have player stats for six hundred. Let's go with player stats for six hundred dollars. Only the Patriots and Steelers scored more fantasy points than this DST. Number three DST last year, guys. Patriots ben. and Steelers. Ben. <sighs> Bills. <laughs> You're really ready with the horn there. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to guess? You got to say who who are the and then guess a team. Uh, who are the Titans? Uh, Heath. Heath. <laughs> who are the Buccaneers? Oh, Heath for six hundred. Well done, sir. You believe that the Bucks were the number three DST? They got a lot of sacks. They improved a lot. Are they a? They, they scored a, a bunch of touchdowns, right? I I'm not sure. I don't. I only, I only I know the surface that, stats. You know, I literally I, have not looked at DST stats one time this offseason. I did when I was looking for uh, some. They had six defensive touchdowns. Wow. But I'm wondering if they're a sleeper team, sleeper DST. Where do you do? You have them in your top twelve? Yes. I think they are. I, I think the only concern would be is, you know, they have to play the Falcons and the Saints four times, you know, so there could be some shootouts there. But their run defense was amazing last year. Their secondary got better. Their pass rush, you know, when JPP was on the field was was very good. 
And so the fact that they kept Barrett is a big step in the right direction. So, yes, they absolutely are. All right, updated standings. Jamie, 200. Ben, 400. Heath, 600. Nobody got any Azer stats. You all got a player stat, so that's good. Oh, no, you didn't. Who got an Azer stat? Oh, Jamie, I got, got, an, oh, Jamie got an Azer stat. stat. That's right. A sort when of I Azer. process elimin- of elimination, Tim, out of my answers and guess Steven <laughs> Sims instead. A wrong Azer Steven stat. Steven Sims is a good guess, though. <laughs> Still all right, either. team stats. But he had, I think he, didn't he have three touchdowns though? In, yeah, in, it was not a very good guess at all. Team stats for two, four, and six. I don't even remember who got the last one right. Heath did. I did. Your boy. I will go team stats for six hundred, please. This team allowed the fewest sacks in the NFL in two thousand nineteen. Ben. Ben. <laughs> you just. I'm sure you're gonna get it wrong. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to say the Chargers. Mm. Oh, no, I have a better guess. Uh, who are the 49ers? Uh, Heath. Heath. The Vikings? I love the sacks and DST questions. Like, those are anything anyone cares about. I thought this was super interesting because the answer is actually the Rams. Oh, wow, that is interesting. Isn't that hmm. weird? Yeah. It makes That's me wonder if it's really wrong. Did you just look at the Rams today? <laughs> <laughs> the Rams allowed the fewest sacks in the NFL. Yeah, he must have gotten the ball out really quickly. I don't know. He never throws deep. Well, can, can somebody that's... confirm that? Because I actually looked. It on... is. I just oh. looked it up. Yeah. God. Yeah. I yeah. No, I, I was so that. insecure about it. I, I double checked. They did that on Jeopardy. Hey. Uh, can you, can you confirm <laughs> it just that, seems please? so wrong. You know, just seems so. Where did the, where were the Rams offensive line in the PFF rankings? You have that. Low. Um, 21, 2, 3, 4, 25. 25, wow. Okay. I, the first teams I thought of were the Patriots and Saints, but you never ask questions with easy answers, so I obviously wasn't going to ask. You know, I that, was just thinking who dropped back the least. A 600. That's why I went with the $400. Exact same, same thought. Um, all right. Uh, Fantasy Jeopardy team stats for 400, Heath. Uh, yes. You're picking that. Okay. Yeah. This team led the NFL in yards per play in 2019. Ben. Ben. Titans. Heath. Heath. 49ers. This is oh, fantasy football. I hit the wrong football. button. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how bad you are at this. Jamie? Uh, Ravens. Who are the Dallas Cowboys? Ah. Best yards per play by a pretty substantial margin. Three tenths of a yard, which doesn't sound like a lot, but I believe the difference between one and two was bigger than the difference between any other spots in the standings in that statistic. Um, and finally, Heath is still the winner right now. Leader. The, yeah, yeah, the, the leader. <laughs> the leader right <laughs> now. Uh, what did I say? I said, I said winner. Mm. Yeah, that's for me. Okay, here we go. Team stats for 200. A chance for Ben to tie and Jamie to tie Ben in second place. This team oh, led... Jamie. <laughs> Before Final Jeopardy. Oh, that, I don't have a Final Jeopardy question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. This team, let's go. This team led the NFL in plays in 2019. Ben. Ben. Uh... Panthers, Falcons, no, <laughs> Panthers. Pa- yeah, right. <laughs> Let the Danafel in plays. Heath, Heath, Eagles. Oh my gosh, for the win! All right, oh. Heath. Oh wait a second. Mm. Did not an- answer in the form of a question. You lose two hundred points. You are now tied with Ben. Congratulations to both Ben and Heath, co-winners today with $400. Way to go. And that was another terrible round of Fantasy Jeopardy. Apple Podcast questions. <laughs> uh, this is from also Why Are All the Names Taken? That's who wrote this review. Um, Russell Wilson, how many more good years can I expect out of Russell Wilson before he drops out of that top six range? It's a very good question and one that I've contemplated often. And really? I, Why? Um, because of Aaron Rodgers. Huh. And because like he's averaged like 80 or 60 or something fantasy points per year on the ground. 
Yeah. And at his age, I wouldn't expect him to continue that. So if they're successful and he keeps throwing in the low 500s of passes and the rushing yards go down, like he's really dependent on that high touchdown rate, just like Rogers was. And uh, we saw what happened when Rogers fell off. Yeah. Fair. Rogers also lost weapons though. I mean, you know, they're giving Russell Wilson weapons. So, you know, hopefully that's the counter to some of this is that, you know, they're giving him some guys to help him. You know, I mean, if they give, uh, you know, Antonio Brown this year, and then, you know, Metcalf is ascending as we, I think, or at least hope in some capacity to, you know, continue to improve after his rookie season and Lockett stays where he is, you know, I mean, there are ifs, but you know, the hope would be is that they continue to build around Russell Wilson, as opposed to the Packers who are saying here, run the ball. Um, all right. So what's the answer? How many years? We did not answer that. Yeah, at all. Not at all. Not close. I'll take three more years. Of I'll take more like four or five. I'd go two to three. All right. So I'm going to, um, detour from Apple podcast real quick. I got final jeopardy. I'm going to hmm. settle this. Uh, okay. Heath Heath has legitimately eight hundred dollars. Okay. Ben has four hundred. Jamie has two hundred. Um, your category is kickers. <laughs> so, okay. uh, do you guys want to IM me your bids? This is why it's very difficult to do Final Jeopardy in this format. You feel free to. You want to IM me how much you're going to wager? I'm going to wager all four hundred. I don't think that's confusing. For okay, anyone. you're yes, going to wager two hundred. Two hundred. Heath, what about you? Um, I will wager one dollar. <laughs> Okay, within five yards, this is how long Harrison Butker's longest made field goal was last year. Wait, I can't really do it within five yards. <laughs> right, that's um... <laughs> no, I will. I will. That's fine. Within five yards, within three yards, make it a little tougher. Within three yards, this was Harrison Butker's longest made field goal last year. And are, are we guessing or we're sending you a oh, message? Can you IM me? I can. Yeah, I am your I am your guess. How Where long I am you? was Harrison Bucker's longest field goal within three yards last year? Jamie has given me an answer. Um, uh, you got three seconds, guys. Well, I gotta pull your name up in the IM. All right, tool. all right, fine. Ben has given me an answer. No, that's not. That's a bad answer. I'm gonna be asking this question. I'm giving you some pressure here. Ben and Jamie are both I, right. They both got it right. I just sent the right. answer to R.J. White, <laughs> not at <Adam either>. any <laughs> So, 54. You all got it right. 53, 54, 55 were the three guesses, and his longest field goal was 56. I, there is no way I could take this title away from Heath. Good job, Heath. You won by How one was that your dollar. question? His long kick was 56? I would assume for any kicker, it's like right around 55, especially one with a good leg. Jeez, uh, that was a really harsh criticism, Ben. Uh, <laughs> not fair. All right, next question from Apple Podcast from Tony Chavez, 1995. Why are you all so low on the Vikings? We aren't that bad. No. What Vikings do you mean? Player? Your offense just sucks. Yeah, from a fantasy standpoint, it's not an exciting offense. Well, I mean, you have a top five overall player who's going to get drafted if he's there. Justin right? Jefferson's so that, not that good, Jamie. Jefferson's not going to be the one in the top five. You're right. Yeah, yeah. It'll be Alexander Madison. Um, <laughs> I think Thielen's going to go anywhere toward the back end of round two or beginning of round three, depending on how many receivers go. So uh, probably round three. How many teams have two players in the first three rounds? I'm, I'm kind of worried about them, though, as a team. You know, I don't know how they were like seventh in scoring defense last year when their defense wasn't really that good. Maybe that's just Mike Zimmer. Uh, I am worried about their defense getting worse. Yeah, but, but losing Diggs I, is a big deal. Not if Jefferson's good. He can't. He won't be Diggs. Like, there's almost no chance he's going to be Diggs. Diggs is super efficient. Plus, Thielen's very pretty injury prone. I don't know. From a not just a non fantasy conversation, I'm, I think Irv Smith is going to be good. Him. I'm excited yeah. about him. I like him too. All like, right, he could, uh, he could be Dallas Goddard. Maybe not top ten finish, but he could be Dallas Goddard. Steven from a football city where no folding table is safe. <laughs> That's Buffalo. Um. Okay, can you talk about holdouts and discuss contracts? Some of the biggest league winners like Eckler and Connor and maybe Madison this year are players that Dynasty or Keeper League players could benefit from targeting before their value blows up. If you could predict likely holdout players, you could target their backups for cheap and possibly land a player with a much higher value rather than just discussing after the news breaks. Any guys come to mind as possible holdouts? 
I mean, Joe Mixon is in the same position as Cook, where they're uh, in the final year, they're, they're rookie deals. Kamara, too. Um, I didn't think about Kamara. That's interesting. But, the, like, again, I, and I don't know, I'm not a uh, CBA specialist, but from what I've heard from people that have looked at it, it's, it's going to be a lot harder to hold out now. Like I'm going to designate you the CBA specialist of the podcast. I'm going to put that From on this you. point forward. I will have <laughs> yeah, all CBA knowledge. Uh, Dave's the vast pretty, majority Dave's pretty good of it. one thing I'll say just broadly <laughs> to the question, the vast majority tend to be in my recollection, I guess it wasn't true for, for bell, but tend to be guys that are in the last year of the rookie deals. I guess sometimes it's guys who got tagged, but you go back to that draft class is what I like to do. Like, so I, rookies in the first round will have a fifth year option. You should know whether they've had a fifth year option or their first round pick, but these running backs we were just talking about were outside the first round cook Mixon, and Camara were all drafted into 2017 draft. You go back to that class. Anyone who's not a first round pick has been probably, and has been good. It's probably been underpaid for a couple of years. They're going into the final year of a four year rookie deal. They would be the ones that I would look at. And then next I year, I think the problem with the, the guys that we mentioned is, you know, the, the guys behind geo in Cincinnati, are such wild cards. So if you're just talking about a, a, a 2020, you know, seasonal thing, Gio has some value. Latavius Murray has some value, but he's older, you know, so those guys don't necessarily have a lot of long-term potential. If you want to trade for Alexander Madison now, that's a smart move because there's a good chance Dalvin cook is out the door next year in Minnesota. So he could be the starter there. Like I don't, I don't see right. Armstead as a starter in Jacksonville long-term, you know, he wasn't a, a, big prospect he wasn't somebody they invested in a lot so even if he does get the opportunity to showcase himself this year he and and the Jaguars say oh we may have found our guy he's not their guy long term he's going to eventually be replaced so that's not somebody I think long term you're looking at as if Fournette leaves you know Armstead or certainly not Chris Thompson is is the guy there so you know in these scenarios I think that are realistic like the the Chargers scenario worked out great because Eckler is a rising player and we'll see how he does now stepping into a full-time role but he got a great scenario last year in those first four games to sort of showcase himself and I think make the Chargers feel comfortable about giving him the contract that they gave him. So I think the players you want to try and target are the ones that are going to step into maybe prominent roles. Last. Like the first thing that came to my mind when you, asked, when, when you read this question is T. Higgins. Like if you, it, you know, somebody that drafted T. Higgins in their rookie only draft and may not be thrilled with the rest of their roster, I would try and get him somewhat cheap because he may not play very much his rookie year, but if he's the guy with Joe Burrow and that's the, the player that they sort of build around after taking him in the second round and AJ Green is most likely gone next year, that's a player that I'd want to invest in because I think he could be good. Denzel Mims, if Brashad Perryman was, you know, middle of his career right now, maybe, you know, not going to do him very much long-term, Mims could be somebody that you could, you know, get some good long-term value from if Darnold, as we talked about at the start of the show, does, does uh, you know, do better. So it's not maybe the, the hidden guys. Cause I don't know if there are very many right now that we could say if this happens or that happens, but I think there's a couple obvious ones to me, uh, Higgins and, and Mims would be two that I would look at. All right. Dynasty question from Paris. And Irv Smith is another one too. If you can get him cheap, that's a guy that I would invest in heavily from Paris. My dynasty league allows for the drafting of free agents during the rookie draft 12 team PPR league. It's not tight end premium. Where would you take? Hayden Hurst, Chase Edmonds, Boston Scott, and Justin Jackson among the rookies. Edmonds is another good example of what we just talked about. Because if Drake does not sign long-term there, maybe he does enough to give himself a big role next year. Maybe not the lead guy, but big role. All right, well, where would you... So Hayden Hurst, Hurst Chase Edmonds are the prizes here. Hurst I'd take higher than I think any of the tight ends in this class which means probably in the later second though or maybe mid second because you know there's some pretty good running backs and receivers that are going to go in the first 15 picks um i'd probably still take a guy like joe burrow over hearst um depending on on your tight end need but that's about where i would value him the other running backs are all guys that i would probably not take until the third round of a rookie draft or even possibly the fourth round uh, they're all guys that have been in the league a couple of years. They're exciting. I mean, Boston Scott's exciting. I, I really like him as a, a target this year, uh, Edmonds too. But you're, you, you'd have to pass up some potentially breakout rookies. You know, like some of these, some you can, I don't just throw away third round rookie picks is the point, like, you know, or even second round rookie picks. So it's, um, 
it's a cost benefit thing. And Dar- like Darrington Evans is going to be there in the third round of your rookie draft, probably or the early part of your third round or Joshua Kelly. Well, Those now given, pro- given the news on Derrick Henry, isn't, is Chase, Chase Edmonds Ch- in a lot Chase, better spot than Edmonds. I'd rather have Chase Edmonds in Dynasty than Josh Ke- than Darren yeah, Evans. That's fair. Yeah, yeah, I I am more I, I agree with Ben almost completely on Hayden Hurst, like early to mid second. I would put Edmonds though, right? I'd put him in the second round as well. The Boston one thing Scott about though, would be more fourth. The one thing about Hurst is we're ranking him, and I think industry wise, ranking him as you know somewhere in close to the top ten. If you're at the back end of your first round, you're probably the league winner or you know guy that made the playoffs. So your team is probably a little bit more set. And so if you're trying to turn your roster over and prepare for the future in Dynasty, then you're probably going to skew a little bit younger. So I think what Ben and Heath are saying is correct. But if you, like, I'm, I, I'm just thinking of, of my team in our league, Keith, where, uh, you know, it's 14 teams. It's a little bit different. But, um, you know, Hurst helps me more now than taking Brandon Ayuk at 14. You know what I'm saying? Like that. Oh, that, yeah. For I, my I can roster. See, sure. If you had a contender that needed a tight end, 14, I don't think is too early. Yeah, I don't either. All right, from CJ Johnson, 12. Dynasty help. Dear Smith, Taylor, Ware, and Freeney. Some good pass rushers there. Yeah. Love the show. Listen all the time. I have the second and fourth pick in my Superflex Dynasty rookie-only draft. I'm in need of a running back, and I have no clue where to go. Should I take Clyde Edwards either? Remember, it's it's, uh, Superflex here. Fourth pick, second and fourth pick. Clyde Edwards, Elair, Taylor, or Dobbins. I know 1.03 will take a running back. I have Drake, Singletary, and a handful of handcuffs. I have Kyler Murray, Russell Wilson, Gardner Minshew, Winston, and Han- and Haskins. Um, so, yeah, he's got picks two and four. Which way would you go there? Clyde Edwards, Elair, Taylor, Dobbins, two of those three? He's assuming Burroughs one. I guess. Burroughs one, you're getting the top two running backs, which would be pretty incredible. Well, well no, you have two, two and four. Two and four, yeah. Yeah, he said he knows that. Oh, oh, right. Three's going to go with a running back. My bad. I'd probably take Clyde or Taylor at two and then take Dobbins at four. But why not take Burrow at two if he's there? He he's has good. Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray, yeah. and who else? Winston and Minshew. Yeah. Well, but DeAndre Haskins. Swift is also an option, I, I assume. He didn't mention him. Unless Swift's going to go number one overall, I, I, I don't know. I would take Dobbins before Swift personally um in dynasty yes yeah i i would take taylor too that's what i would do you'd, you'd go taylor, taylor and dobbins taylor? i'd go taylor over uh yeah taylor and dobbins probably assuming that clyde edwards hilaire would go three okay so you would rank them taylor edwards hilaire dobbins like that correct does he say it was running backs for drake and who drake and singletary yeah he needs a running back more than the quarterback but let, you know, if, if Burrow falls to four, I'm taking Burrow at four. All right, this is from yeah. Chucky Buckle. How do you feel about the idea for COVID setups? Have your top four bench spot, bench spots on the site be who you want to be a replacement if you have a late minute scratch due to COVID, and if you decide not to roster a backup quarterback or tight end, you're out of luck. I've said this. Uh, I think it was a show you one of the the shows you missed, Adam. That one idea that I would float out there is just. If the quarterback is ruled out last minute or, or day of and your roster is locked, it just becomes TQB. So you Why not get just that. do Team QB then? I don't understand. I mean, you can, but the problem with that is, you know, it, it changes the, the, the outlook of it for the Saints, for example, that are going to use Taysom Hill or, you know, whatever the Eagles are oh. going to do with, you know, uh, Jalen Hurts. So for those scenarios, like, I, I wouldn't want to screw with somebody's I guess that's, that's a good point. Yeah. scoring. But I think if you're just – you know, it's only really a last minute thing because if you're able to make moves on Sunday, then you should be able to you know, find a replacement option. But I do think that if, if you have the ability to sort of just, that's an easy position, you know, you just make it the quarterback for the team. I just, I'm really leaning towards in my leagues, at least all being um, blind bid waivers on Wednesday morning or Tuesday overnight. And then first come first serve the rest of the week and nobody locks until they play. It's not a bad idea. Yeah. I certainly I mean, don't think you, now, you, you now, can't to do be clear. If you get dropped on Wednesday morning, then you're going back on waivers for two days. It's not like somebody can just go pick them up immediately. Yeah. So everybody gets a shot every week at everybody. And then it's first come first serve. Yeah. And I, I, you certainly just cannot do fab Saturday night. No more transactions Sunday. I mean, that's just not an option at this point. Uh, for Unless this you're going to do it like how you do baseball, for example, where you open it up. Yeah. Which I've done. Yeah. I do that for our podcast league. I open it up. Manually, I would strongly which is suggest not doing that. Yeah, like, it's do a really have good job of that. 
It's have always we come a to a consensus what we're going to tell people in terms of IR spots? Two, four, five. I mean, it's it's like, only for COVID or it's for everything. Well, I think you factor in everything, but COVID changes it. Um, I would do like four then. Uh, yeah, if, if you're doing COVID only, I would say four, because I don't want to penalize somebody that has just everything go wrong for them <laughs> over a two, like everything's gone bad enough for them already. So it's only COVID four. That's what I would say. I want to, I, the backup ideas come is, you know, this is something we talked about too, where you like name two players and their best ball options, but the rest of your bench is still a bench and you call them backups. And that's kind of similar to the, the listeners question as well so you're saying the sunday morning or saturday night somebody has sent an email or some designation of these are my replacement guys yep. so yep. it's essentially flex plays extra work yeah yeah i'm definitely not doing that <laughs> it sounds like too much work to me <laughs> <laughs> all right guys thanks a lot have a great weekend everybody enjoy yourselves we'll talk to you on monday with a i think it's gonna be a pretty fun episode if blank happens then blank wide open to interpretation it's going to be fun. We'll talk to you then on Fantasy Football Today. See ya. Go win your league. Want more of the Fantasy Football Today podcast and nonstop year-round fantasy advice? It's simple. Hit the subscribe button and hang with us all throughout the year.